Um, I'm really honored to be here um, today to speak to you all, and I feel really incredibly fortunate and blessed that I get to do so from the inside of my own home. Um, the fire, I, I live right off of um, Talent Avenue on Meadow Slope, and the fire literally stopped a block um, from our home. Everything on the other side of Talon Avenue is, has been decimated, as you all know. So that was quite an intense day for us. Um, we were trapped against the fire line for eight hours, my husband, myself, and my seven-year-old son, Carlo. Um, and I've never been in a state of sustained abject mortal terror quite like that. We were behind in the baseball diamonds of uh, Chuck Roberts Park. We had no way out. Uh, it would have been one thing if it had just been me, but you know, if anybody has children, then you know, you, you would just do anything to not have anything happen to your, your child. So that was probably the more traumatizing part. Um, of, of the experience. Um, about eight o'clock, the, the 8.30, the police came and let us know they'd opened up an access point for us to get to Ashland and we were able to um, to escape. And uh, it, in, in situations like that, you really don't care about anything but physical safety. Um, I really was not concerned with whether our home survived, but it did. Um, and we found out about two o'clock in the morning um, that, that we were one of the very, very blessed and fortunate ones. Um, we were without power for about a week. Um, and I came, my husband came back home the next day. He was, he was really concerned. Um, and we joined him a couple of days later. And I remember walking down the block and standing in, um, one of the mobile parks that, um, that had burned down on right on Arno street and just looking around and thinking, you know, if it had happened to us, we at least have insurance. These are, um, minorities. These are underprivileged, um, and underrepresented people. And it was just heart wrenching to know that, um, they didn't have a safety net. They didn't have a backup and it's hard enough. Uh, when you do have insurance, I know a lot of people that are having to rebuild. Um, so the, the guilt, um, that kind of came along with that, I think survivor's guilt is a really, uh, it's a real thing and uh, we've experienced it and had to unwind from that experience as lucky as we are it definitely affected us um, and it's been just a, just a heartbreaking experience for our community but also really beautiful and seeing how quickly the, the community mobilized and snapped into action um, and begin to assist each other so um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot about the experience and um, I told Caden and Karen, they're welcome to share the link to my story. It's on Medium and if you'd like to read it, um, I can't even begin to scratch the surface of that particular day. We were not given any warning. Um, there was no, you know, I, I know, I know people that got a um, text alert two hours after their homes had burned. So we kind of had to look outside and go, well, a uh, house across the street is burning. We probably better, <laughs> better get out of here. Um, yeah, so. There's my timer, but thank you all for letting me speak today. Hmm. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I read Nicole's story yesterday and it uh, is incredibly heart wrenching and a gripping, beautifully written story. So I encourage you to um, check out the link. Um, thank you. Thank you uh, for being with us, Nicole. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, my name is Ellie Holty. I'm with the Local Innovation Lab. We're a, an internship program in cooperation with SOU. And um, I'm uh, friends with Karen based on some of our work around um, rebuilding ideas. Obviously, this is all in the very, very beginning stages. Um, in one of the projects around land use that we were both kind of involved in, um, we were working with a couple of our interns. And a couple of them are here on this call. So. I will introduce Caden Jones. Hi everyone, I am so happy to be here with you all. My name is Caden Jones. I was a recent SU graduate majoring in environmental science and policy. And like Ellie said, I interned at the local innovation lab and now I'm, I'm employed with Rogue Valley Housing Solutions as the events coordinator. And I'm also working with Michaela, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, all. Um, I'm Michaela. I'm also a recent SU grad, also majored in environmental science and policy and was able to um, intern with the local innovation lab and work with Ellie and Caden. And now I'm also employed with Rogue Valley Housing Solutions as the communications coordinator. And I feel very lucky to be a part of this. Um, and yeah, it's been a really amazing opportunity to be a part of. Awesome. A couple more notes before we um, introduce Dan. Um, everyone whose email addresses that we have uh, will receive a link to this recording 
we will be recording this. It is recording good. Okay, um, a link to register for our, our upcoming events. And I'll tell you about those a little later and supporting documents will be also included in that email. Um, so if we don't have, if you didn't register for the event, we probably don't have your email address. So if you could throw that into the chat, that would be great. We'll make a note of that, get you on our list. Um, also, if you'd like to let us know either in the chat um, via direct message to uh, Caden, or um, you can let everybody know how you'd like to participate in recovery efforts, we can possibly help get you um, steered in the right direction and collaborating with, with people that we're connected with. So um, I think we have one more announcement from Michaela before we start. Yeah, I just wanted to let you all know, um, I know a lot of you wanna help as much as you can. And there's one way you can help now, the Fire Relief Center in Phoenix is always looking for more volunteers. And I'll be talking a bit more in detail later about this, but I'm going to put the sign up link in the chat and you can look at it um, later as well. Um, and I'll talk about it more later. Great, okay. So today we are welcoming um, Dan Bryant and he is going to be speaking to us on a few points. Um, one is making housing affordable by nonprofits owning the land and homes, developing communities where residents are co-op members and financing a village, all of which are super fascinating, um, ripe subjects for discussion. So looking forward to hearing about that and our Q&A afterwards. So uh, Karen, would you like to say a few other things about Dan? Uh, I've worked with Dan for uh, several years and he's amazingly dedicated to bringing affordable housing, uh, especially to the working poor. And tiny houses are a great solution and he and his, all the people in his organization have um, made that happen in Eugene in a wonderful, wonderfully uh, excellent way. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Ellie. Thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, yeah uh, this opportunity to share with you. And I, I do have a personal connection um, uh, here to fire. My sister uh, was one of those who lost her home uh, in the Beachy Creek fire in the little North Fork of the St. E.M., just a few miles down from Opal Creek, which is also um, one of our family uh, vacation uh, places uh, where we spread my mother's ashes. Uh, there's real irony there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I'm very appreciative of this effort and my, and my heart goes out to, to Nicole. I, I don't think I could read that story right now, uh, but I will. Um, and uh, all the, the victims of the fire uh, that have just, uh, you know, impacted so many, so many people. Uh, we were very fortunate that my sister had enough fortitude to anticipate what was happening because she has four horses and uh, and a two horse trailer. <laughs> so do the math, right? And uh, she got all four of her horses out in time, uh, making two uh, trips frantically, you know, uh, through all of that and uh, has her own stories that are uh, quite incredible. So at any rate, uh, uh, it is a, a great opportunity to uh, share with you um, uh, with this. And so I'm going to uh, begin with just uh, sh sharing uh, the story of uh, Square One Villages and a little bit of my own uh, personal story uh, as a part of that. And can you see, are you seeing my slides? Yeah. You, uh, you do see the slides? Yes. It's hard for me to tell. Okay. Um, so um, I actually was a pastor at uh, First Christian Church in the heart of Eugene for uh, 29 years. And being a, a downtown church uh, was constantly dealing uh, with issues of uh, homelessness and uh, people struggling and, and trying to find shelter. And, uh, you know, I've, I've come to believe uh, this is an enormous challenge for all of our communities. And I think, uh, like a chain, that um, uh, communities are only as strong as their weakest link. And no one benefits from having unsanctioned camps and scattered around the city and people living out of their vehicles. Uh, and these are issues you just can't simply zone away. These are human beings. And the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights calls housing a human right. 
and federal courts have backed that up most recently with the Boise decision. And as a result, uh, cities like Eugene and elsewhere are now realizing they, they have to do more about this problem because it's as cruel and unusual punishment to criminalize that what human beings must do in order to survive when they have no other place uh, to go. So at that church that I served, um, uh, we had a number of uh, ministries uh, to respond to the needs of uh, the unhoused, including a, a free breakfast, a clothing ministry, uh, hosting uh, temporary shelters um, for families during the school year. Uh, for 10 years, we were the central hub for what was called the Egan Warming Center. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, open uh, on nights when it was freezing temperatures, uh, 80 to 90 people sleeping in the basement of our building, um, as well as other places scattered around the city. Uh, for over 20 years, we served as the um, as one of the places where the what we called our parking lot ministry, uh, people camping uh, behind the church. Uh, in uh, trailers and what we call Conestogas. Um, and by the way, we have with us uh, Todd uh, from Community Supported Shelters that builds those Conestogas, another great nonprofit here in Eugene. Our Sunday breakfast um, that uh, unfortunately had to be discontinued during the uh, pandemic served over 300 people. Overall, we had over 22,000 contacts each year with uh, people on the street through a variety of different ministries. And I've gotten to know many of these people in our community quite well. And I think there's a stigma and a shame that often comes with being home homeless. But the real shame is that we have made it nearly impossible for the poorest of the poor to live with any dignity among us. And I decided that uh, I needed to focus more of my energy from pulling people out of the river to going upstream uh, to figure out why people were falling into the river, right? And I teamed up with this guy, Andrew Heaven, uh, who has published uh, some of this work in his book, Tim City Urbanism, uh, who is now our project director, along with a number of other community uh, people to uh, establish uh, our nonprofit. And we built that nonprofit from the ground up um, and we call it uh, Square One Villages because we are helping people to start over again, creating self-managed villages of tiny homes for people in need of housing. And we began with Opportunity Village Eugene, which is a, I like to say a gated community uh, for the unhoused. Um, and that opened in August, 2013, a village of about 35 people uh, it was built mostly with volunteer labor over a period of nine months, uh, lots of donations from the community, the villagers themselves involved. And I like to say it takes a community to build a village and we had lots of community involvement and support. Became a very attractive community um, where uh, we keep, the average stay is about 12 to 18 months. There's no maximum, but the residents are expected to be working on a transition plan while they're in the village. There are 30 units, um, including Conestogas and, and little bungalows, sleeping cabins um, that uh, in most cases do not have uh, electricity or plumbing, but the village does include a, a heated bathhouse, a laundry facility, raised garden beds, an outdoor cooking area, um, uh, and other community uh, amenities. Uh, the cost of this project uh, was uh, just a little over $200,000, but half of that was in-kind donations. We operated on about $6,400 a month, which comes out to $6 a night per person. The villagers pay $35 a month themselves to help uh, with that cost. So our net cost is about $5 a night. We think it's one of the most effective, cost-effective shelters in the country. And one of the biggest problems uh, that uh, we see is helping people to move out to find permanent affordable housing. And we had a significant number of people in the village. They had jobs, they had income, uh, but they simply did not have enough income to afford the rent without some kind of assistance. And when you look at the statistics of our housing authority, uh, you can see why. Back then in 2014, the wait time uh, for getting into one of their housing programs for a family who needed a three bedroom apartment 
was one year. Families that needed two or four bedrooms, the wait time was two to three years. But oddly enough, single individuals, couples without children, like my friends Juan and Rhonda uh, here, uh, for them, that wait time was over six years. And typically the wait lists were closed. And one of the reasons why that we have such a dearth of affordable housing and especially uh, housing for um, smaller households is that it's simply so expensive to build. Uh, and in most cases, it's actually more expensive for a variety of reasons than it is to build a, a market rate housing. Case example in Eugene was our wonderful Bascom Village, a name for a former mayor, which I consider the gold standard of affordable housing, very attractive project. Um, but it cost $169,000 per unit back in 2014. And today, of course, that cost would be much higher. So there was a report by the Oregon Housing and Services Commission in 2019 that found the average cost in the state of Oregon for affordable housing was uh, $226,000 per unit with costs increasing three to 4% annually. And right now because of the fire, it's actually going up much higher. There is uh, one public official of, in Roseburg who just told me recently that a project of theirs uh, cost uh, over $300,000 per unit. So we decided we could do better and that we could build a new uh, affordable housing project unlike any un in the country. Uh, and we purchased a acre of property in the Whitaker neighborhood uh, back in 2015, broke ground with our mayor. She's standing in the middle of that picture there uh, with the future residents. Uh, we recruited a team of 13 architects um, to donate their services and in many cases even build the tiny homes for us. Uh, the average size of those homes is 160 to 320 square feet. The cost uh, of the rent is 250 to $350 depending on the size. Uh, the designs are simple, but they're not cheap. They're quality built. Uh, they're very livable. Uh, full bath and kitchenette. Uh, about $45,000 per house, uh, plus another $30,000 just for the land and the infrastructure. Um, still, that's a fraction of what most affordable housing costs. Um, and the end result is a very attractive village, I think would be welcome in almost any neighborhood. Indeed, when we started this project, uh, we, we got some resistance, very typical, you know, not in my backyard kind of, uh, comments, uh, but after we started building it and people started seeing what it was, uh, they quickly turned around and and uh, and uh, there's a lot of pride in that neighborhood, I think, even uh, with this wonderful project. Um, so we're providing long term uh, permanent uh, housing uh, for people who cannot afford uh, traditional housing. Now, similar to what you would find in manufactured home parks, there is a clubhouse that has meeting space, a large kitchen, laundry facilities, um, because in a tiny home, you need to have other space where you can meet um, and have birthday parties and things of that nature. Uh, but we also created very attractive open space uh, because uh, that is also critical to uh, in tiny homes that you have outdoor space and you need to give uh, uh, very intentional thought to that space. Um, and unlike most affordable housing projects, uh, and this is what is unique, uh, Ellie mentioned the co-op, uh, the residents of Emerald Village are not simply renters. They actually own the co-op, which leases the facility from the nonprofit with a share value of $1,500 um, so that they have both an ownership stake in their housing and then therefore they are much more apt to uh, take that responsibility for it as well as to receive the benefit from it uh, so that if they do choose to move on they have that equity uh, and we're not just building uh, affordable housing we are building small communities where the residents are empowered by working together to create not only a place to call home but to great, create greater stability in their lives and a new future and this is the really wonderful thing about this work uh, when you do this, because there's something incredibly powerful, magical even, when you hand over that key to a new resident to never dream of having their own home again. And, um, you know, by involving the residents in, the, in that process as well, there's often this relationship that they establish uh, with the builder that's just really wonderful. And 
one of the really interesting things about this project we didn't anticipate was the age um, of our residents. Uh, over half of our applicants were over the age of 60 and lived on fixed incomes. A uh, great example here is Gibb, who is a veteran in his mid 70s. Um, and so in retrospect, I think we could have built some more accessibility features into it. And we would do that uh, in the future with this kind of project. Uh, another of the senior citizens living there is Alice. Um, uh, Alice doesn't mind sharing the story because she talks about it herself. Uh, she took an early retirement at the age of 62, thinking she could live on Social Security. And Alice is a wonderful person, but she's not a financial planner. And uh, when she realized that she could not afford the rent on that income, she moved into a campground to save money. Uh, but then when it became too cold, she came to Opportunity Village, lived there for two years before she moved to Emerald Village. And on that day she moved in with tears in her eyes, she told us she thought she was going to spend the rest of her life living in a shelter. Um, she's a wonderful resident. Uh, another person, uh, LeBeau here, um, who, uh, this is a picture taken at our annual fundraising event. Uh, LeBeau lives on a very modest uh, disability income. LeBeau takes so much pride in his home. He spent over 400 hours working on it himself. He chose the colors, helped paint it, um, and uh, he never hesitates to show it off uh, whenever we bring tours through. And right now we're not doing that anymore, but, but when we do bring tours through, and hopefully we will again soon, uh, Bo loves showing off his home. And, and the beautiful thing about it is on his fixed income, he can afford to pay for it himself. He has that pride of being able to pay for it himself of the day he doesn't need any other uh, support. Well, we took this concept to Cottage Grove to see if we could replicate it in a rural community. And um, Cottage Village was opened uh, last year with nine tiny homes that have been completed. There are four more that are under construction. Uh, we simplified our designs, used uh, four different designs uh, so that each one isn't different, uh, just to make it a little more economic to build. Um, and we have our own building crew, not quite as reliant on volunteers as we were for Emerald Village, but very much like uh, Emerald Village, it is a co-op. And Emerald Village, the co-op share is valued at $1,500. At Cottage Village, we lowered that to $500 to make it even more affordable. Uh, but they pay that share off over time so that after their share is fully paid up, their rent actually goes down. Uh, now, here's one thing I can tell you about building in a rural community. Because of the difference in the zoning requirements, we had much greater cost efficiency in Eugene. Uh, so there we could put 22 tiny homes on an acre. In uh, Cottage Grove, we could only do 14. And as a result of that loss of cost efficiency, it was about uh, nearly $100,000 per home, plus the fact that this was built a couple of years later. So it's a little more expensive uh, um, building in the rural community. Our next project uh, we call Peace Village. Uh, we're seeking to build 36 uh, tiny homes on a just under two acres piece of property that we hope to buy this year uh, from a church in Eugene. And then we had a uh, nearly a four acre site donated to us um, that we're looking to build 75 to 100 units probably about five years from now. Uh, and then lastly, uh, our newest project we call C Street is a single lot in Springfield. I call this our micro village. Um, it appears to be actually two homes, a larger home in the front of the lot and then a smaller home in the back. And you can tell from this picture that there are two units, an upstairs unit and a downstairs unit. Uh, so this is built as an accessory dwelling unit and essentially turned into a duplex, just top and bottom instead of side by side. But the house is actually four units. And in this floor plan, uh, the ground floor on the left and then the upper floor on the right um, two, uh, are four single bedroom units. Uh, each with their own kitchenette and, and bath. Uh, so this uh, project costs around $600,000. So in other words, we're able to produce six homes for about $100,000 a unit. Again, less than half the cost of a typical affordable housing project. Now here's the key for this. Until recently, you could not do this um, in anything except maybe an R2 or an R3 zone. 
but because of the passage of House Bill 2001, cities uh, have to change their rules to allow for more of this kind of development, even potentially in R1 zones. Um, but that's, is, it's up to each community to establish those rules. Um, so if your community hasn't done that yet, uh, talk to your city councilors. It's something they're required to do uh, under the, uh, by state law under House Bill 2001. Uh, but that's something any community can do to reduce the cost of housing because it, there's no subsidy involved. You're just changing what's allowable uh, to be built in different zones. Um, we had uh, one of my project uh, program manager, Jeff Albanese, did a presentation for uh, City Club of Eugene um, on Friday that was broadcast on KLCC last night. Um, so at klcc.org, you can find that broadcast. And um, together with a couple other people, they talked at great length about some of these concepts. And uh, one of the things I think Jeff really honed in on was the fact that uh, R1 zoning is exclusionary, that it actually drives up the cost of housing and it has made it much more difficult for communities to develop affordable housing. So that's a, just a very interesting policy issue that we all have to look at um, as communities. So let me say just a little bit more about the style of housing that we are developing and the legal structure for it, as well as the financial strategies. So we call this the village model. Uh, it's a combination of using community land trust and housing co-ops. So just a, a, a word about housing co-ops um, because they've been around for a long time, especially on the East Coast, I think a little more common, um, where apartment buildings have been converted into co-ops. And typically the tenants band together, pool their resources, purchase the building, take out a mortgage, and then they own that building. Uh, and housing co-ops a little different from condominiums where you own your apartment. In this case, if there are 100 apartments, you buy the building, everybody owns one one hundredth of everyone else's apartment. Um, and then you combine that with a community land trust, also something that's been around for a long time, used for a whole variety of purposes, basically any public good from preserving natural areas to supporting civic organizations and creating affordable housing. And the basic idea is that the land trust is the steward of the land and ensures that it is used for the benefit of the community in perpetuity. And when you combine the community land trust with a housing co-op, you take the cost of the land out of the equation. So instead of paying for that cost of the land, the co-op only has to pay then for the cost of the housing and then they pay a, a modest fee for the ground lease. And the community land trust can set that fee at whatever level they desire. If it's well-funded, it can be as low as a dollar a year. Uh, but more importantly, the land trust then sets the, the terms for those structures. So in our case, we want to keep affordable house, housing affordable. So we use the limited equity co-op that sets the limit on the value of the shares in the co-op uh, so that if housing prices skyrocket, someone can't just go out and sell their membership um, to the highest bidder on the free market. And nor can the co-op decide to collectively cash in to sell their project to a developer. And this actually has happened, especially in New York, uh, where you had these apartment buildings converted to the co-ops, uh, you know, back in the 50s, housing prices skyrocket, they see a chance to cash in, they just sell the whole thing, move out um, and, uh, you know, cash out. And now that project is no longer affordable. So the community land trust prevents that uh, from happening. Um, so the village model then just in one image here, if you start with the land trust there at the bottom of the image, um, the land trust uh, leases the property to the co-op, provide it's the steward for permanent affordability and and very importantly it provides training to the co-op members and this is one of the things I've learned in doing this work is most people come into our projects and they're used to being a rent a renter they know how to do that they know how to be a tenant what they don't know is how to be a landlord because now they are the landlord as well as the tenant. And uh, so you have to train people on that process. And the co-op, the housing that's on that property, uh, then that leases from the land trust and provides that affordable monthly payment uh, and the limited equity to the residents. And, and of course the goal to keep it affordable is then to operate at cost. So there's no profit margin built into this. 
Uh, so that's part of what also keeps it affordable. And then, and then, of course, they operate through a democratic process, electing their board members, making the decisions, and so forth. And, and that, too, also sometimes takes a little bit of education. Uh, so three primary benefits to the structure that, uh, first of all, uh, we believe very strongly that resident-owned housing is always, or at least almost always, preferable to rental housing for a number of reasons. It increases financial stability. It gives the resident a stake in the property. Therefore, they're much more likely to take care of it. It allows the residents to build at least modest equity, depending upon the level of equity. And actually in our C Street project, there the equity will equal the value of the improvements, the housing itself. So in that case, um, it's a much more significant equity. Um, and it gives them more control over their housing and, and their future. And secondly, uh, unlike some affordable housing projects, especially those uh, financed with tax credits where you just have a private developer, at the end of the period dictated by that financial mechanism, they can turn around and convert it into market rate housing. So in our, in our case, uh, the housing will remain affordable in perpetuity through that structure of the community land trust. And finally, it's a low risk investment. Um, and a lot of studies have shown that co-op housing actually is uh, lower risk than uh, private housing, that the default rate is lower because you have all these different households who are invested into its success. One person has difficulty, they rally around that person. Um, it doesn't threaten the entire project. And uh, finally, I'll say just a little bit more about um, and then some of the financial strategies. So first of all, if we start on the left-hand side of this graph with the community land trust, there are a variety of ways that you can fund the purchase of the property. Um, talk to your city about community development, um, CDBG uh, grants. Uh, talk to Oregon Housing and Services uh, about uh, possible funding sources. Uh, we chose to do it through fundraising. Uh, we have purchased all of our property up to date just, just by uh, fundraising and, and occasionally with some grants as well. Uh, it's just simpler in many ways. It's a lot of work, but you don't have to go through um, some of the processes that you have to do to get public funding. Um, and then once you have the land, then financing the improvements and particularly for any group that is not experienced at doing housing development, we recommend working with a development partner and, and especially someone who has experience uh, working with banks, uh, working with Oregon Housing and Services Commissions, which is the primary provider in the state for uh, housing grants, uh, doing things like uh, low-income housing tax credits, um, and then also just other fundraising uh, that you might do to cover the, the gap uh, if the other sources aren't sufficient. And then the residents themselves. So there's different ways to structure this. Uh, but depending on the income level of the residents, uh, where they purchase their share, uh, one way to do it, if you said uh, we're looking at in one of our projects of a share value at $5,000. Well, most low income households aren't going to have $5,000 available. But there are programs, in particular, the IDA program, where low income people, if they're signed up for an IDA account, they're setting aside money, $100 a month kind of thing that gets matched through that program. Uh, I think it's three to one, uh, maybe more than that now, um, so that their dollars are, are multiplied and set aside. It, the, those dollars can only be used for housing and for a few other purposes, uh, but people in IDA programs might have the, uh, sufficient money that they could put that $5,000 down. Uh, we're looking to do that in our C Street project, for instance, um, or setting up a revolving loan fund um, where the residents pay into that and then that must used to finance someone else's membership share down the road, other homeowner assistant programs, but encouraging in some way, developing a way that uh, so that those future residents of the program are actually also contributing to the cost to it, even if uh, it's a small amount. Uh, finally, uh, just some of the resources that we have uh, available on our website at squareonevillages.org. There is what we call our toolbox that has uh, a list of resources. And then we have a new website called the Village Model. It's actually the, the address is villagemodel.org without the the in front of it um, that has a lot more. 
uh, on it. Uh, we developed this website with support from Meyer Memorial Trust. And uh, there are some articles that go into great length uh, describing this whole model of the community land trust and the limited, limited equity co-op uh, and how to set those up. And then I'll just close this portion with an image that uh, comes from Emerald Village, Eugene. Um, this mural that uh, we hired an artist to paint who spent a couple of months dialoguing with the residents of what kind of images they wanted to see on this wall that's the back of the building uh, next to the village. And of course, we had to get permission from the owner of the building to paint this mural. But this beautiful, beautiful mural, as you can see, and all of these wonderful images of new life, butterflies, uh, a forest fire, especially appropriate now, that is now coming back to life. And at the far end, there's a campfire with a phoenix rising out of the ashes and images of the villagers themselves in the constellations above and in uh, dancing around the fire. And I think that pretty much uh, says it all. Um, as we seek to provide a place where everyone belongs, that every person may find a place to call home. And as we like to say, it all begins with square one. So uh, there's my email address, dan at squareonevillages.org. And uh, welcome, you're welcome to send me questions to follow up. I'll try to respond as best I can, and then to respond to whatever questions you may have here today. Ellie, you're, you're, you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you, Dan. That's incredibly inspiring work and thank you for sharing the stories of the actual residents as well. Um, before we go to Q&A and I'm gonna hand that over to Caden, I just wanted to let everybody know um, again that we are going, we did, we have recorded this and we're gonna send out a link to the recording um, and um, any and some supplementary documents to you as well as information about our upcoming events if we have your email address. So if you don't think we do, please drop it in the chat and uh, we'll make note of that and put you on our list. 